What is Lepidoptera? Listen in and you'll find out. And welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana, where I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. And I'm Dean Ash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on several acres out in the country. We call ourselves Garden Angelists because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want others to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Carol. Hello, Dee. Want to hear about my garden this week? I do. What's well, suddenly hot and it ain't raining? <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Oh, uh, but there, I got a I got a big ripe tomato out there. I think one more day and I'm going to be able to pick that thing and have me a big bacon lesson tomato sandwich with one slice of tomato that goes from corner to corner and side to side on that piece of toast, which is just perfect. Yeah, so you toast your bread. Of course. Not everybody does, Carol. What? I know. Heathens, Neanderthals, what's wrong with people? (laughs) My goodness. Of course you toast your bread for a BLT. Bacon, lettuce, and toast. No, tomato. (laughs) I do have to water now. And, uh, you know, I did order some bulbs. So we can tell people to order bulbs now because I got mine. It's probably time to start ordering bulbs. Yeah. I haven't done it yet because I can't decide what I want to plant. So there you go. What's going on in your Oklahoma garden this week, Dee? Not very much. Um, the autumnal sneezeweed is starting to bloom right outside my window here. Ooh, nice. Nice. Um, a few butterflies, some moths, especially some clearing moths, um, some bumbles. Not, you know, it's 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 buggy. It's a buggy time of year very buggy that it is i see some butterflies and a few bees outside my window and i decided that out this window even though it's the front yard i'm going to put a big old bunch of zinnias out there next year oh you should because that'll be really pretty and you'll enjoy them i will enjoy them are we ready for the quote already yes we are summer's lease hath all too short a date by william shakespeare from one of his sonnets thank you william as always, you you come in in the clinch. And I thought about that because it just seems like yesterday we were wondering where summer was. And now around here, the kids have that extended school year calendar. So they're all back in school. Oh, where you are. I don't know yeah. if kids are back in school. I don't think they are back in school. Well, there's a few places that do it all year, but there's been a lot of talk about going back to school. So I know a lot of them aren't back yet. But they will be in about a week or so for sure. I forgot to say something about gardening here. Is we're recording this on Sunday and it rained this morning in what? August. I know I should mention that. It rained quite a bit this morning, which is weird. We had a big old pop-up storm. Anyway, yeah, I, I will say that summer seemed to go by really fast for me now, but as a kid, they stretched out forever. Which is wonderful. I loved summer when I was a kid. Didn't you? Oh, yeah. It's my favorite time of the year. I always loved going back to school for like a day or two. And then it's like, oh, this is a grind. Yeah, the new clothes. (laughs) That was awesome. You got new clothes. You got to see all your friends you didn't normally see. And then you start having to do homework. The end of that fun. Exactly. And so you could go outside today. And like you said, your autumnal sneezeweed, which is Hellenium autumnal, is in bloom. And that's a sure sign that we're getting towards the beginning of the end of summer. We are. And that's our flower for the, this week. Right. Autumnal it's got a terrible sneezeweed. name. Sneezeweed. Yeah. I don't like that. I don't like the name at all. And the name doesn't have anything to do with it making you sneeze. Cause I looked it up. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. I see what you say. They used the dried leaves to make snuff. Yeah, apparently Which they inhaled to cause sneezing so they could rid themselves of evil spirits. So and that's do you for- do that, D? D, no. I just got to know, do you dry your sneezeweed leaves and make a snuff so you can get rid of the evil spirits? Oh, heck no. And all that information came from the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. We want to be sure and give them credit. Um, I think that sneezeweed has a terrible name, just like milkweed has a terrible name. There are other things that do, too. And we should all grow it. It's a it's a native, at least to my part of the world. 
Is it yeah. native where you live too? Uh, you know, there's probably some sneezeweed out there. And there's more than one kind of sneezeweed too. Mm-hmm. And it starts blooming about now. Yep. And um, the other species, we'll mention them quickly, Helenium flux, flux, uh, flexuosum. I don't know why I was having trouble with that. That's the one that has the purplish brown ball of disc flowers. Okay. Okay. And then there's also slender leaved sneezeweed, which is Helenium amarum. And it has thread like leaves. I've never seen it blooming. So I can't, I can't speak to it at all. I think I've just grown the common old autumnal sneezeweed and I, it's disappeared from my garden. So I do not know what happened, but it don't always stay forever. No, a lot of plants don't always stay forever. And that's something we should probably talk about because people really want a sure bet. And I'm like, there really isn't one. What is a sure bet these days? Hmm, that I can't think of anything that's a sure bet right now. Not a thing. Maybe Phlox paniculata. It's pretty much a sure bet, but some of it gets um, mildew, powdery mildew on its leaves. So there you go. Even it isn't a sure bet. Right. So you found out that the Helenium is named for Helen of Troy, that Linnaeus named it for Helen of Troy because the flowers, the flowers sprung up from the ground where her tears fell. Boy, this just, this just gets weirder and weirder. <laughs> Weirder it has a lot weirder. going on for it, considering it's just a, a basically a prairie plant, right? It, it is just basically a prairie plant. And so I have that one perennial border that is mostly prairie plants. And that is where the thing was blooming. Yeah. And that's where I would replant is in that perennial border. Yeah. And here it's right outside my window. And then I bought some more. I bought, so there are cultivars or selections of yes. sneeze weed. There's the standard yellow one, which is what I'm looking at just starting to bloom outside my window. And it is blooming a little bit late because I cut it way back in the spring because mine gets too tall. So I cut it back. I did that old Chelsea chop on it. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. I do that with a lot of stuff and sometimes that'll delay flowering, but that's okay. And then I also planted more Heim beauty down in my lower garden in this one spot that I'm trying to get you know, good balance on good symmetry. It may or may not work, but anyway, it has come through the spring, the spring of intense rain and paths sliding into it over and over again. So the point <laughs> of all that is it's a tough plant. It is. And so I'm going to go back out to that little garden area. I haven't really inspected closely, but I, it might still be there, but I, I don't think it is. That's just crazy. Unless it just got too wet there. That's the only thing I can think of. Or got crowded out by a bunch of goldenrod. That could happen too. Well, goldenrod can sure crowd out anything. That's true. And so that's about the only thing that I think could crowd out sneezeweed is goldenrod. Because right now I'm looking at the sneezeweed and it's really crowding out my Gina Phlox paniculata. So I want it to stop doing that. So I'm going to have to, I'm probably going to have to pull some of it out. Anyway, easy to grow, likes basic soil, is not invasive. One of our listeners kind of got onto us and said that we don't, we don't mention it often enough that things can be invasive in other places. They can be. And so when you are getting ready to plant something, you ought to look up and often your local co cooperative extension service or your state will have a list of known invasives. And so if you are not familiar with it, a plant and you don't know for sure, and it seems like something that would spread like a ground cover or something, you are well advised to look it up and kind of get in the back of your mind. Hey, these things are invasive. And she brought up a juga because I guess she's from Connecticut and in her, it's a problem in Connecticut. It's not a problem here, but it's a problem in Connecticut. So everybody just keep in mind when we suggest a plant or talk about a plant, go look it up in your own state. Yeah. And let me, let me just say this. There's two kinds of invasives in my opinion, in my opinion, uh -huh. when I think of a, a juga, I don't think of a plant that escapes the garden and shows up over at the neighbors. I think of a plant that spreads and can spread out into your lawn and take over more space than you intended. And that is invasive and that may be a problem. And then on the other hand, you have things like um, Euonymus fortunii, which escapes your garden and shows up all over the neighborhood. 
And that's a real definition of an invasive, that particular yeah. one. Um, right. So there's rampant spreaders, which you don't really want. No. And there are invasives. Some right. of them are on a list that they can't even sell them in your state. Like um, honeysuckle, not American honeysuckles, but the Asian honeysuckles. Oh my gosh. Those are horrible. Um, caliper pears, including Bradford, which is yeah, part the of calorie that group. Pear. Calorie. I said caliper. I meant calorie. The calorie pears are a huge problem. And they're a huge problem in Tulsa for that matter. There's just things that we plant and we don't always know. And then it comes back to bite us later. And those are it truly does. invasive. So it we're going to include a link to sneezeweed, which is not invasive at all. And um, it's on American Meadows if people are interested in getting some for their gardens, because there are lots of different cultivars. Sometimes they're red, like Morheim Beauty. Um, sometimes they're yellow and sometimes they're yellow with a brown center. So cool plant. It is a cool plant. Hit us with that next quote. And then I'll tell you why I picked it. <laughs> I, I wondered when I first looked at it and then I said, oh, I get it. Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. And the man who wrote that is Brewster M. Higley. Yes. And so I went down a tiny rabbit hole to figure out who wrote you that because I already knew the words to it. What kid doesn't learn those words to that song when they're little? I, it's I, like this land is your land. Exactly. We all learned both of those. So Brewster was born in Indiana, but he moved west to in, to Kansas to stake his claim on a homestead. And yeah. at one point, someone else, a woman ac accused him of plagiarizing the poem from her. But it was determined that he wrote the poem, which is my Western home between 1872 and 1873. And then the cowboys of the West put it to music. Yeah. And it's quite popular. I mean, even back then, cowboys sang it a lot. And I think it's because it's just like other songs. When you're away from home, you wish for home. Right. So Brewster wrote that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't I don't know if he was still in Indiana when he wrote that or if he I don't know. Anyway, we were going to talk about either. people who kind of get this big idea that they're going to turn their home, their property into a homestead. And do chickens and bees and great big vegetable gardens and fruit orchards. And, you know, depending on how much land they have, maybe get a little pig to grow to slaughter or and a, we, cow. a cow, <laughs> a couple of goats. Maybe there's goats at the end of the street in a in a property that butts up to the neighborhood. They have goats. I've seen a cow. <laughs> Mostly it's they have horses. I don't ever see a vegetable yeah. garden or fruit trees or anything. So I think they're into the animals. But I would say every young client I have who wants garden coaching has homesteader dreams. Yeah, they they want. all want to be homesteaders. And I empathize with them because when I moved out here years and years ago, I didn't know very much. And um, I wanted, I wanted kind of that homestead feel. I have fruit trees. They don't produce a lot of fruit. It's a long story and we don't have to go into it. Um, I now have bees. I have had chickens. I've, I've, I owned goats for a day. Yeah. I'm glad the goats left because the goats and the garden don't really go together. Do so they? my suggestion is probably don't get goats if you want a garden. Exactly. And so they, you know, there are a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there are homesteaders that put themselves out on YouTube and take these videos and make things look pretty darn nice and pretty darn easy. But you know, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. It's, hard. it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah. So we would tell people homestead dreams are great, but we would have some advice. One of them would be to start small. Don't try to do everything at once. Have a few successes. Yes. Have a, have a lot of successes. I always say, start with the garden first and go ahead and start with raised beds if you can. And if you're living out in the country, you're going to need a fence because you're going to have deer. Yep. And uh, rabbits. you need to start working on your fence, fence with rabbits raccoons. and deer. Raised beds help with the rabbits, but yes, raccoons, well, <laughs> raccoons, you'd have to enclose everything. And that's another thing about chickens. Guess what likes to eat chickens? Hawks. Hawks eat chickens. Raccoons foxes, eat chickens. Fox, fox in the hen uh, house. Foxes eat chickens. Um, People eat chickens. Yeah, everything loves chicken. You could, you could have somebody just steal them. Snakes love eggs. 
Yeah, people, and if you live in town, people might steal them. Snakes, oh my God. That's why I wouldn't have a homestead. Snakes, <laughs> yuck. Well, we have snakes out here, but you know what? You don't see them much unless you have chicken eggs. And then you will see rat snakes because rat snakes love chicken eggs. Opossums love chicken eggs. So I found, one time I found two baby opossums in the chicken feed. I won't tell you what happened yeah. to the baby opossums. So keys to a successful, I can guess. <laughs> successful homestead. Start small. Get advice from other people. Find a mentor. Don't look at the people on YouTube and think you can do it just like them. They may live in a nope. different state. Right. And also find somebody that's done it in your state, in your area. Yeah. I would say get a mentor in your area. And as for honeybees, everybody wants honeybees right now. I would not get honeybees. I don't. Uh, well, they're hard. I would not get honeybees unless you get a mentor first or take a beekeeping class in person, not one online. Correct. That's And then you'll meet other people and then you'll have like a, a beekeeper support group if that's such a thing. There is such a thing. There's a bunch of beekeeping groups in Oklahoma. And so by by knowing people in your area, you know that, you know, Bees get varroa mites at a certain time of the year. There's just different things you can know. And it's the same way with like food production. You'll learn what you can grow in your particular area really, really well. Right. But if you really want to have a homestead, Dee and Carol are not going to stop you. No, not going to stop you. It's free. That's right. You live in America. You can have a homestead, but start small. Well, and. Here's the other thing. If you're going to have a homestead and you, like I, live in an area with a homeowners association, we have rules. We have rules. We do too. No pigs. No, well, no livestock. Well, here we have no pigs, particularly. So yeah, because pigs smell. Pigs do smell. Bless their hearts. So do chickens. All right. I'm going to do our next quote. Yeah, let's go somewhere else. I don't want a homestead today. <laughs> A walk about Paris. Wait a minute. Before I do this thing, the other thing about homesteading and if you have livestock and everything, you can forget lolling around in bed in the morning. You got to get up and feed the animals. It's a lot of work. <laughs> you have to break water in the winter time. Exactly. That's a huge part of it. All right. Now I'll do the quote. A walk about Paris will provide lessons in history, beauty, and in the point of life. Thomas Jefferson. Tell us about the book, D. He loved Paris, didn't he? He did. So the book this week is for everyone who's just on vacation, but can't go anywhere. And it's called Paris and Bloom. And it's by a woman named Georgiana Lane. And it is mostly a picture book of beauty. And I don't know how I ended up with this book. I think someone actually gave it to me. Very nice. But I, it's gorgeous. It's got all kinds of different pictures. It is not something that you're going to have to read a lot of. There's some reading in the beginning, but mostly it's just beautiful, beautiful pictures. Sort of like Pinterest used to be and is no longer. This is part of a series of books that includes London in bloom and New York in bloom. And it's fun for dreaming. That's good because I read a lot of World War II history and they, they talk about Paris uh, a lot of the a uh, lot of the stories take place in Paris, so it's hard sometimes to envision what Paris looked like. I have never had a desire to go to Paris. Paris is very beautiful. I've been there. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, really. Oh well, see, I took all that French all through college. I I loved. I always wanted to go to Paris and I finally got to, and when we went, it was raining and it was raining so hard. It was raining buckets and eventually Paris actually flooded. And our tour guide, he was like, so sad for me. He said, I'm so sad because you were in, I'm not going to do it in his accent. Cause I would butcher it. He said, because you finally get to come to Paris and it's raining. I think he said buckets. And I said, you know what? I've always wanted to come to Paris. Nothing is going to make me not love being in Paris. And that's true. It's good. Did you go to the Eiffel Tower? I did. I did go to the Eiffel Tower. It was amazing. I went to the Eiffel Tower. I went to the Louvre. I went everywhere. It was wonderful. Did you go to Versailles? Isn't that outside of Paris? We went to Versailles. Yes, we did. It was beautiful. I can imagine. I've still, you know, I don't know. I took no, French in high school. Go. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't speak French. And my French teacher was kind of horrified at how I attempted to speak French. So there you go. <laughs> 
It's not an easy language. I don't speak French either. I understand a few words. So that's for, that is our book on the bookshelf, Paris and Bloom by Georgiana Lane. Yes. And so next we're going to talk about our dirt, which is all of all you, Carol. Well, we're going to talk about what is Lepidoptera. And Lepidoptera is the fancy family name for butterflies. And moths. And moths and skippers. Don't forget the skippers. Mm-hmm. I so, won't forget them. Here's the story. So my honey locust tree has a bunch of those webworms, which are the larva of some kind of a moth or something. And every honey locust tree in the neighborhood has it. So across this, across the way, I won't tell you where. So I saw a guy (laughs) spraying the tree. And I said, I just said, hey, I got that too. I just kind of acted curious. What you spraying? He said, just a general insecticide. We want to kill the Lepidoptera. And I said, <laughs> oh, I said, I have too many bees and butterflies in my backyard to be doing something like that. Because aren't you killing them bees, too? And he said he didn't say anything. I said, too many. I said, I got too many birds. And then a bluebird flew by. And I said, like that bluebird just flew into my backyard. <laughs> so then the homeowner came out to, you know, because I'm talking to her insect guy. I don't know. And she said. He said, well, this will take care of your Lepidopter problem. And I just looked at him. I said, why don't you just call them butterflies? Because that's what they are. And he he just looked at me. So I bet he was really excited to see you. Well, I mean, he'd already done the work. But the point is, so I'm going to try to control this webworm, which is nasty. I'm going to go around the backyard because a lot of the leaves have kind of fallen in a clump and they've got that webbing around them. I'm going to pick those up and put them in the trash. So, you know, I'm trying the least uh, poisonous method of taking care of these. And in fact, I will never, ever spray that tree. I'll never spray Mm -mm. insecticide just willy nilly in my backyard. Well, and we need to point out, I mean, if he was only trying to control those worms, he could have sprayed BT which is dangerous to all caterpillars, but it's not dangerous to the bees. But I suspect he was doing something like, you know, like one of the mainstream ones. And I'm not going to name a bunch of deals because after, you know, after you and I talked about this and you told me this story, which I'm not sounding as horrified as I did when you told it to me the first time. Yeah. I also have another story. So I was on, I was on Instagram and a lady messaged me and she was asking me questions about Rudbeckia because I showed some, I showed some pictures of my Rudbeckia Goldsturm and it looks really great right now. Uh-huh. Right. And, and by the way, this year, the Goldsturm is attracting, attracting the skippers like crazy. So yay. Um, and in the process of that, she said, wow, I have to be so careful with my and she, black eyed Susans. I have to put seven on them. Huh? <laughs> She said, I, this happened two days ago. I have to put seven on them because of the worms that get all over them. What? And I didn't, I didn't jump on her or anything. I wrote back very sweetly. And I said, those worms are probably the larva of silvery checker spot butterflies or border patch. They both eat Rudbeckia and border patch tends to go for things in the sunflower group. Anyway, she was horrified. She was horrified. And she said, Oh my gosh, they just kill all of my Rebecca. And it is true that silver, I can't even say it. I can't even say it. I'm so distressed. <laughs> it is true that silvery checker spots do kind of destroy Rebecca herda, right? The regular, the fuzzy leafed Rebecca's. Yeah, they do here. Um, but here's the thing. And I talked about this on Oklahoma gardening last week. If you'll just wait a little bit, the wasps will come cleaning up some of them. So you exactly. won't kill the whole thing. And you might lose, you might lose a plant. I've lost two or three plants, but if you grow Rebecca herda from seed, you'll have a whole bunch of them. Number one, and you can pick one plant to just put all the caterpillars on. You can. And so what I actually do is I shake them off into my hand and then I walk over and I put them in the gold stern because nothing can kill it. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. So just think about it before you spray stuff. That's all we're saying. And I or am, I am still hopeful that the tree is large enough that these webworms aren't going to kill it outright. They're going to hurt your tree. I mean, it's, it's a little gross to go it's out unsightly. and that's, yeah, and get one of those, those worms come down. They look like little grains of rice, but 
I'm hopeful that birds are eating some of them, which is good. Good nutrition for them. I'll just clean it up off the ground. The ones that fall, the clumps of leaves that have the webbing in them. I'll just clean those up. And eventually I think I'll be all right. And if you plant some Rebecca Goldstern, if you're having trouble with silvery checker spot, you can move the caterpillars over. That's right. So they won't get all of your herda. So just something to think about. Now, I will say that I did spray BT, which is a natural, it's not really an insecticide, but it's a natural disease of caterpillars. I sprayed it on one the bacteria. Yeah. It's a bacteria that kills them eventually makes them not want to eat. I did spray that on one of my, it was my rising sun red bud. And I got chastised by a lady who said that I shouldn't do that ever on the, even on that one tree, but they destroyed it. So I do understand but seven is also something that kills everything. Right. So it's just, you've got to figure out what is, yeah. what is it that you're willing to do? And this, this guy said that, that you can't buy BT in Indiana anymore. And I haven't found that that's I don't true. Believe him. So I still have to do that research. But anyway, all this bug talk's getting me down, D. Let's talk about rabbit holes. Let's do, because that'll be a lot more fun. Do you want me to start? I do. I love your rabbit hole. <laughs> My rabbit hole is this little teapot and I will, I promise I will post a picture on our, on our Instagram. It is the cutest little teapot and it has a little newspaper with an article about blue willow, a trowel, a flower pot. And I think that's all in a little basket. And it's, it's sitting on this little chair. It looks like a garden chair, an iron garden chair. And it's a little tiny teapot and it's called, I don't know what it's called. It's made by a man named Paul Cardew. And that's what he does. He makes miniature popular little teapots. And this is an old one. And so I just saw it and I bought it and I sent it to you. And so we, we have a little article about him, but I don't know if we'll get to link to it or not. Yeah. And I did send you an article about Wendell Berry that we talked about last week. We talked about him last week and. Oh, I love Wendell Berry. We're going to link to that article. There's some some good stuff in there. That also fits in with our whole um, homesteader thing this week. So there you go. Right. So I went down a rabbit hole. I tried to pull you down two rabbit holes. I tried to pull you down. Didn't work. I tried to pull you down a a rabbit hole of counted cross stitch with a video I found on YouTube. And then I tried to pull you down into another rabbit hole about publishing and collecting cookbooks. There's a podcast I found that is all about publishing and collecting cookbooks. And I thought I was in D this podcast. Is it just about cookbooks or is, or do they read a bunch of different no, books? No, it's cookbooks. The book Cougars? No, no, oh, no. I didn't. No, I discovered the podcast Book Cougars, which are two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. That's their tagline. They're on a kick to get people to read big books this summer, like over 400 pages. But they talk about all kinds of books. And it's just a fun podcast. But the other podcasts, and I have to go back and find, I think it's called Cookbook Love. But it's about collecting and publishing cookbooks. And I thought this this has got D all over it. It does have D all over it. Oh, I see it now. I, I You actually sent me the one with the book cougars too. So I'm excited about cookbook love. I'll definitely go listen to that one. I love cookbooks. All right. Well, that was my rabbit holes. Well, thanks for sharing those with me. You're right. It's so, time to talk about the garden commissions now. Yes, because we talk too much about Lepidoptera, probably. So now we have to move on. Okay, so I don't have much of a garden commission. Um, I'll keep cutting back and looking at all the Lepidoptera in my garden. And I've seen a lot of growth fritillaries lately, both male and female. Um, I'm not bringing in monarch caterpillars this summer, fall, because I'll be out of town some. And I moved my youngest daughter out yesterday. So I no longer have a daughter at home to free the butterflies for me if I leave town. So the little caterpillars are on their own, but I did provide them with lots of milkweed. Very nice. My garden commission, I'm going to pick ripe tomatoes, I, I think. Um, most of the week I'll be tied up with garden com has a virtual conference. that starts on Wednesday, which is the day this podcast drops. So I should have time in the mornings to water, maybe do a little bit of light weeding, definitely harvest. And I do need to order some more bulbs for one of my sisters who said, Hey, get me some tulip bulbs. So I got to do that. But other than that, Mm. that's the week. Anyway, we want that's a big week. We want to thank you for listening to the Garden Angelus. If you like our podcast, please tell your friends about us. Also hit that subscribe button so you don't miss anything. 
And if you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review that helps us get noticed by others. Could you also share our podcast with your gardening friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. Yes, and be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And if you want to help support us, use the affiliate links. If you buy something after clicking through on them, we're in a small commission and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Bye everybody.